What is up, everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. These are my full card breakdown and predictions for UFC Vegas 72. We got Ricky Simone going against Song Yadong. And we are back for another full card breakdown and prediction video. We are back in the Apex UFC Vegas 72. On paper, honestly, it's it's not the best looking card in the world, but I still think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to deliver. I think there'll be some violence, and that's all I can really ask for on a Saturday. So looking forward to it, as always. Uh, before we get started, if you guys can please leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. Um, less than 300 subs away from 20K. Hopefully get there in the very near future. Once I do hit that 20K mark, I'm going to be start, um, start implementing a brand new show every single week. So that's something awesome to look forward to. Um, if you guys have not already, sign up on DFS by the numbers.com lots of stuff going on over there i have three bets right now it's going to be kind of a lightish card for me this week i'd say i don't want to give all the profit away from last week uh, which was probably my second best week of the year thus far with ufc vegas 71 i do want to shout out my guy uh, sergey pavlovich for coming through cashing a first round knockout ticket for me or should i be thanking uh curtis blades for for not wrestling either way um up over four units last night um, it's been a great year thus far. It's been a very good year, just picking my spots, being a little bit more aggressive as well than last year, I'd say, and it's, it's definitely working out. But on a card like this, I, <laughs> I don't want to give back all the profit betting on Jake Collier, Martin Budai, and you know fights like that. So either way, it should be a good card and definitely looking forward to it. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, DFS underscore numbers, Instagram, DFS by the numbers. If you guys have any comments, questions, or concerns, my DMs are always open. And lastly, I'll be going live Friday. Um, for the final thoughts live stream and then also Saturday for the best bet live stream as well. So make sure you guys subscribe, turn on the post notification bell so you guys don't miss out on the content throughout the week. And also going to be looking at getting out some early content for UFC 288. I'm sure a lot of people aren't really looking forward to this card and I can understand it. Um, unless you're a complete diehard fan like me, but, uh, I'll probably get some early content out for 288 sometime midweek this week. So something else to look forward to. All right, guys, with all that out of the way, I say we get into this very, very good card, and we're going to kick it off with a very, very good fight. We have Haley Cohen going against Jamie Lynn Horth, newcomer. We got Haley Cohen, 31 years old, 5'8", with a 69.5-inch reach, 7-2, and 4-1 and and in her last five fights. Jamie Lynn Horth, she is 33 years old, 5'7", with a 67-inch reach, 5-0, and and obviously 5-0 and in her only five fights. So we'll take a look at the odds here like we always do. And we see that Haley Cohen opened up minus 205, believe it or not. She's now minus 110 pick em. And then Jamie Lynn Horth opened up plus 175. She is a minus 110 pick em. And, yeah, I guess the, a, a big thing to mention here is a couple things. Jamie Lynn Horth, she's making her debut here. She has not fought a little over a year. Uh, she had a really bad injury. Um, she took some time off. And the thing I don't like about Horth in this matchup is she is coming up a weight class. So this, I believe, is going to be her first fight at Bantamweight. And that kind of concerns me in this matchup against Haley Cohen, who I don't think she has the most skills in terms of MMA. I just think she's a, a really good athlete, and she's very physically strong, and she's pretty big for the weight class. Um, and I think that physicality could definitely give Jamie Lynn Horth problems. Um, there's not a ton of like tape on Jamie Lynn Horth. I think I was able to watch two fights, so not much to go off of. But um, Lynn Horth does have some solid power in her punches, and then she's also very aggressive once the fight hits the mat. Five wins for Jamie Lynn Horth, all five of those coming inside the distance and both of Haley Cohen's losses coming inside the distance by submission. Um, if this fight hits the mat, which I think it will, I think Jamie Lynn Horth is going to be very live for a submission here. Haley Cohen, not only has she been submitted twice, but there's fights where she's getting put in very bad spots. Like, um, there's a, a bunch of times where she's getting very close to getting submitted. And, you know, props to her. She's able to fight out of a lot of these, but my goodness, she's making a lot of mistakes down there. And Jamie Lynn Horth is a solid grappler from what I've seen. So. The move up a weight class for Jamie Lynn Horth scares me. The layoff scares me. Her coming off of a major injury scares me. But in terms of a pick, I am going to take Jamie Lynn Horth to at some point get a submission in this fight and give Haley Cowan her third submission loss. Give me Jamie Lynn Horth. I'll say third round submission. Um, should be an interesting fight to kick off the card. 
Moving on, we have Brian Kelleher going against Journey Newsom. Not really sure why, why Kelleher's this low on the car. Maybe they'll change it throughout the week, but kind of disrespectful to the to the guy, to the veteran and Brian Kelleher. But either way, Brian Kelleher, he is 36 years old, five foot six with a 64 inch reach, 24 and 14, and two and three in his last five fights. Journey Newsom, 34 years old, five foot five with a 67 and a half inch reach, 10 and four and one three and one no contest in his last five fights so we'll take a look at the odds here brian kelleher is the favorite he opened up as a minus 190 favorite he's currently minus 150 and then journey newson opened up plus 165 he is currently plus 130 and yeah i like kelleher to win this fight i suppose um you know on the feet the, obviously what concerns me the most about kelleher is he can definitely lose minutes there um, he has a negative significant strike differential. Um, he has a 64-inch reach, but he does have some power. Uh, where I think Brian Kelleher wins this fight, though, is going to be with the wrestling. Like We've seen in a couple fights where Brian Kelleher is going out there and implementing that wrestling, that grappling. We saw him go out there against Domingo Pilarte. Um, went out there, got three takedowns. Like, one takedown, and that was the round. He controlled Domingo Pilarte for 12 minutes and 50 seconds. Now, I will say, you know, it's going to be a lot harder to control a guy like Journey Newsom, but still, I think that's the path. Journey Newsom on paper has like a 43% takedown defense. Um, he can't be taken down. He can't be controlled. And I think that's going to be the game plan for Brian Kelleher here. Uh, a concern I do have though with Brian Kelleher on the mat is the fact that he has been submitted like a very concerning amount of times, eight times. Brian Kelleher has been submitted eight times. And for what it's worth, Journey Newsom is a black belt. He hasn't really shown that off thus far in the UFC, but he's a black belt in BJJ, so maybe Journey Newsom can, can catch something off his back. Um, but outside of that, I just see Brian Kelleher mixing in the takedowns, using that veteran savvy, getting this fight down to the mat, controlling Journey Newsom, and uh, winning a decision here. But laying chalk on Brian Kelleher is not something I really want to do this week, but I will be picking him to win this fight, and I'll pick Brian Kelleher to win this fight by decision. All righty, we got uh, Stephanie Egger going against Irina Alexeva. We got Stephanie Egger, 34 years old, five foot six, with a 68 inch reach, eight and three, and three and two in her last five fights. Irina Alexeva, she is 32 years old, five foot eight, with a 66 inch reach, four and one, and four and one in her only five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. Believe it or not, Stephanie Egger, one of the biggest favorites on the card. She is. Um, oh yeah, she opened up minus 205. She's currently minus 275. Irina Alexeva. Open up plus 125. She's currently plus one or plus 235 now. So I'm not really sure what's what's going on here with Irina Alexeva. I'm not really sure why she's in the UFC. Um, this this matchup doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Like I was watching Irina Alexeva, just extremely unimpressed. She's big. She's very big. Five foot eight. Um, she's going to have a height advantage here. Um, she uses her size decently well but I mean she's not a, a great striker she makes a ton of mistakes on the mat um this should be Stephanie Ager pretty much all day uh, I think Stephanie Ager is going to get on top at some point and finish this fight via TKO or submission Stephanie Ager eight wins seven of which come inside the distance she's very dangerous on the mat she's very dangerous on top uh I don't think Alex Sava has anything for Stephanie Ager like outside of uh I don't know, an arm bar from guard or something weird from Alex Sava. Like, Stephanie Ager should get this win. Um, I don't think Alex Sava's size is going to be enough here for Stephanie Ager. Do you want to lay minus 275 on Stephanie Ager, though? No, you, you probably don't want to do that. But she should go out here and win this fight. She should be able to get down Alex Sava at some point. And when she does get on top, I think it's going to be a wrap here. Give me Stephanie Ager. First round submission. I just don't think Irina Alex Sava belongs. Unless I'm missing something. Unless she's made drastic improvements from what I've seen I think this is Stephanie Ager and Stephanie Ager inside the distance so give me Stephanie Ager give me Ager to win this fight by I'll say first round submission I think it could even come early here all right next we have an absolute banger I'm really glad Josh Quinlan gets to stay on the card after Angelusa had to pull out but yeah we got Josh Quinlan going against Trey Waters we got Josh Quinlan 30 years old six foot with a 72 inch reach six and oh and obviously 5 and 0 in his last 5 fights. Trey Waters, 28 years old, 6 foot 5 with a 77 inch reach, 7 and 1 and 4 and 1 in his last 5 fights. We do have odds. We just recently got odds. And we got Quinlan opening opening up minus 225, currently minus 150, and then Trey Waters opening up plus 190, currently plus 130. 
So yeah, the biggest thing to mention here is a couple things actually. Trey Waters is six foot five at 170 pounds. That makes literally no sense. This guy is huge, huge for the division. 77 inch reach. This guy's very long, very rangy, and he packs a ton of power. What I don't like about Trey Waters is a couple things. This guy fought a week ago. He literally fought a week ago in a fight that did go into the second round, in a fight where he got head kicked, he wobbled bad, almost got finished, and then a couple seconds later ended up getting the finish in his own right. So he fought a week ago, he took some damage, he got hurt, and now he's fighting this week on a week's short notice, and you got to imagine, Trey Waters has to cut a ton of weight. I mean, getting down to 170 when you're six foot five, this guy's weight cuts have to be an absolute nightmare. I mean, you have to. You have to think so, right? So I'm curious to see Trey Waters at the weigh-ins. Will he even make 170? If he does, I'll be extremely impressed because this six foot five at 170 makes no sense to me. So that's a big concern. Him fighting a week ago and, and getting rocked is a big concern. The weight cut is a big concern. His striking defense is a big concern. This guy, he fights with his hands very low, and he could potentially get caught here by Josh Quinlan, who hits like an absolute truck. Like Josh Quinlan has the death touch. This guy hits very, very hard. Josh Quinlan, I believe, is actually a black belt in BJJ as well, has a solid submission game. Um, he doesn't go for takedowns as much as I'd really like to see, but when Josh Quinlan gets on top, he has vicious ground and pound, and like I said, he has that submission game in his back pocket there. Um, I think somebody's getting knocked out here. I think somebody's absolutely getting knocked out here. It's just who gets knocked out. I like the fact that Trey Waters is going to have a, a massive height and reach advantage, but with him coming in here on short notice, him just taking a fight last week, him having to cut weight um, twice within the span of a couple weeks, I don't like that with, with Trey Waters. So I'm going to take Josh Quinlan. I'm going to take Josh Quinlan to win this fight by first round knockout. But I definitely think somebody's getting served here and somebody's getting served quite early. Josh Quinlan hits so hard and I think he's going to connect on the chin of Trey Waters. So give me Josh Quinlan. Josh Quinlan by first round knockout. Very, very fun fight here. And um, I think there's going to be some violence in this one. Moving on, we have Charles Johnson going against Cody Durden. We got Charles Johnson, 32 years old, 5'9", with a 70-inch reach, 13-4, and four, and 3-2 three and in his last five fights. Cody Durden, 32 years old, 5'7", with a 67-inch reach, 14-1, or 14-4-1, and one, and 3-2 and two in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. Charles Johnson is the favorite, opening up minus 145, currently minus 155. Cody Durden is the dog, um... Opening up plus 125, currently plus 135. And this is probably the toughest fight for me to call on the card. Um, it's a fight I've been going back and forth on because I just think both guys have path to, passed the victory here. This is uh, about as striker versus grappler as you can get. Cody Durden's going to absolutely go for takedowns here. And although I think Charles Johnson has very good takedown defense, I think Charles Johnson has a very good getup game. I think Durden can get him down here. The, the big question for me and why it makes this fight so hard for me to call is, can Durden's cardio last the full three rounds? I don't see Durden going out there and finishing Charles Johnson. Charles Johnson's as tough as they come. Um, underrated grappling. Very, very durable. Cody Durden, I don't, I don't see him finishing Charles Johnson. So I think for Durden to win this fight, he's going to have to, to grind it out via decision. And... I could see a scenario where Durden does have some success early and then he starts to slow down. We've seen it before. But man, Charles Johnson, he's been taken down in, in all four UFC fights. Salgas got him down once. Jimmy Flick got him down. Ode Osborne, for some reason, took him down three times. And then, of course, Makayev took him down 12 times. Durden's a very good wrestler. He has a wrestling background. He's a really good grappler. The problem I have with Durden is the potential cardio issues. Um... But with that said, you know, Durden has been able to wrestle into the third round in a couple fights against Richie Long in a fight he won. He was able to still wrestle a little bit in the third round, although he was clearly tired. Against Carlos Moda, he was still able to wrestle into the third round, although he was clearly tired. So he's able to kind of push through it, which I like. Um, but Charles Johnson is going to give a lot more resistance than a Carlos Moda, who didn't really work his way back up. He's going to get a lot more resistance than a Richie Long. So I can see this fight going either way. Um, so for that reason, I will take the dog here in Cody Durden to win at least the first two rounds with that wrestling. I think he can get down Charles Johnson. I think he can hold him down and win at least those first two rounds with the third round potentially being sketchy. But yeah, give me uh, Cody Durden here. I think he wins this fight. I'll take him to win this fight by decision. And in my opinion, one of the toughest fights to call this week. 
but I'll take Durden as a dog. All right, moving on to probably one of my favorite fights on the card, but also probably one of the weirdest fights on the card. We got Natan Levy going against Pete Rodriguez. We will start with Natan Levy here, who is 31 years old, five foot nine, with a 72 inch reach, eight and one, and four and one in his last five fights. Pete Rodriguez, 26 years old, five foot nine, with a 73 inch reach, five and one, and four and one in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. Natan Levy, one of the biggest favorites on the card, open at minus 140, currently minus 255. Uh, Pete Rodriguez open up plus 120, currently plus 215 here. So um, something I, I do want to point out with Pete Rodriguez is this is a guy who's making his debut at lightweight. Like I'm taking a look um, at his amateur career, and this is a guy that was fighting at at middleweight. Um, he's fighting at he's fighting at welterweight. Um, he's fighting. I think I saw a, a fight where he weighed in at 205. Yeah, light. He has a light heavyweight fight um, back in 2019. My goodness. Um, and then yeah, he's fighting at uh, catch weight of 175, catch weight of 175, and his, uh, he's welterweight. So this is going to be his first fight at 155. So that's definitely something to mention for Pete Rodriguez. Uh, something else to mention for Pete Rodriguez is this is a guy that gets in and gets out, whether he's winning or whether he's losing. This guy has. Six fights, all six of them finishing in the first round. Five of six finished under one half of a round. He's going out there and starching these guys and starching them early. Like he has a 10 second knockout, a 41 second knockout, minute 25. He has a ton of power. Um, the reason why I believe Natan Levy is such a big favorite here, not saying this, this price tag is deserved, but the reason I think Natan Levy is such a big favorite here is because of the question marks on the Pete Rodriguez side. What does Pete Rodriguez look like in the second round? What does Pete Rodriguez look like late in the first? Because we don't even know that. What does Pete Rodriguez look like in the third? Whereas with Natan Levy, we've seen him in the second. We've seen him in the third. He has good cardio. He is durable. So I think there's a lot of question marks with Pete Rodriguez. Like, what does Pete Rodriguez's ground game look like? Is it good? Is it bad? We're going to find out come Saturday because Natan Levy is going to take this guy down. So... If, if you like Pete Rodriguez, you probably bet him knockout one because that's literally how he wins the fight. But I, I think I got to pick Natan Levy um, just because he's much more proven and he has a path to victory here in that path to wrestle. Like Natan Levy, very, honestly, very, very good wrestling, very good grappling. Um, went out there, got a submission win in the third round on the Contender Series. Um, he was able to compete a little bit with Rafa Garcia, took Rafa Garcia down a couple times, took down Mike Breeden nine times in that matchup. Um, was able to take down Gennaro Valdez six times. Yeah, this guy can wrestle, and this guy can grapple as well. So I'm going to take Natan Levy here to get the fight down to the mat and submit Pete Rodriguez in the second round here. Could it even be in the first, potentially. Like, if Pete Rodriguez's ground game is horrible, he could sub him in the first. Like, we don't, we don't know. There's no footage out there of Pete Rodriguez off his back, from what I've seen. Um, so, yeah, give me, give me Natan Levy. Give me Natan Levy's second round submission, but this is going to be a fun fight. I'm really looking forward to this fight. Kind of a weird one stylistically, but um, as a fan, it should be a very, very fun fight to watch. I think um, you know, Pete Rodriguez, is, he's going to bring it, and Natan Levy is going to try to get this fight down to the mat. It should be a fun one to watch there, but give me Natan Levy's second round sub here. All right, moving on. We have the, this is probably my 1-800 gambler fight of the week. Last week, it was Muhammad Usman, Junior Tafa. A fight that probably shouldn't be bet on, and, and this is probably it here. We got Jay Collier, Martin Budai. We will start with Jay Collier, who is 34 years old, six foot three, with a 78 and a half inch reach, 13 and eight, and two and three in his last five fights. Martin Budai, 31 years old, six foot four, with a 77 inch reach, 11 and one, and five and zero oh in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds. Um, I feel like nobody should be favored in this fight, but we do have a slight ish. It's about a pick. I'm Jay Collier, minus 115. Uh, Martin Budai is minus 105. For me, this fight all comes down to the game plan of Martin Budai. And I think there's some recency bias here. I really do. So Martin Budai, you take a look and watch every single Martin Budai fight. What he does is he uses that size as a weapon. He's six foot four. He's a big heavyweight, probably cuts down to 265. He's huge. What he does is he takes his opponent, he pushes them against the cage, 
and he wears on them. He wears on them. He does damage in the clinch against the cage, and he sometimes even takes down his opponents. He doesn't do it in the UFC for some reason, but sometimes he takes them down. He's a he's a brown belt. He has good ground and pound. Um, I would like to see him go for more takedowns in the UFC, but yeah, right now, no takedowns landed for Martin Budai, but it'd be very smart for him to go for takedowns. Um, you got to imagine. Because if you get Martin Budai on top of you, you're probably not getting up, especially if you're Jake Collier. So yeah, Martin Budai uses that size um, to put to push you against the cage, get you tired, and eventually finish you. We've seen it time and time again with Martin Budai. For some reason, though, in his last fight against Lucas Bresky, he did not do any of that. I think he compiled, like... No control time whatsoever. I want to see the exact number. He compiled six seconds of control time. That's not a Martin Budai fight. That's not how he fights. Um, but he went out there and struck at range with Lucas Bresky for 15 minutes, clearly losing the fight. Clearly losing. It wasn't even close. Lucas Bresky outlanded him, outlanded him about two to one. Um, I thought Bresky won clear as day. And I had Martin Budai in a parlay for some reason. Um, so. I think a lot of people are thinking that Martin Budai is going to come in here and stand at range with Jake Collier for 15 minutes. If Martin Budai comes in here and stands at range with with Jake Collier for 15 minutes, he's going to lose the fight. I mean, it's it's not even close. Jake Collier, much higher volume. Jake Collier, much faster on the feet as well. For Martin Budai to win this fight, he's got to go back to, to what he's always done, and that's push Jake Collier against the cage, use that size, because Martin Budai is an actual heavyweight, whereas Jake Collier is a middleweight fighting up at heavyweight. Um, you could you could cut off Martin Budai's right leg, and he still could not make middleweight. Um, this guy is huge, and I think he's going to use that size to his advantage. But yeah, it all comes down to the game plan of Budai. He's going to go out there and, and with the game plan he had against Bresky. If he does, he loses. If he comes in there with the game plan he always does, I think he has a path to victory here. But this is a mess of a fight. This is a fight I want nothing to do with. Um, even if Budai strikes at range with Collier, like we've seen twice recently, where Collier went out there, outstruck Carlos Philippe. I think he won that fight, but he lost it because Carlos Philippe's landing the bigger shots. He has power, whereas Jake Collier has no power whatsoever. Um, against Andre Arlovsky, outlands Andre Arlovsky. I thought he won that fight, but it was Arlovsky landing the bigger shots, having the bigger moments, ultimately winning the fight. I could see a situation where Collier's clearly outlanding Martin Budai, but Budai's landing the bigger shots, and the judges apparently look at that. So, um, what nothing to do with this fight whatsoever. I'm going to take Budai here, and... I'm actually going to take him to finish Jake Collier. I think if, if Budai gets a takedown, which I don't know why he doesn't wrestle more. If, if Budai gets a takedown and gets on Jake Collier, and gets on top of Jake Collier, it's a wrap. We saw what Chris Barnett was able to do to, to uh, a very tired Jake Collier. Budai should use his size, get a get a freaking takedown, get on top and, and use that brown belt, man. So I'm going to take Budai. I'll say second round TKO for Martin Budai. But this is a fight that nobody should be confident in. Like last week, everybody was confident in Junior Taffa for, for no reason. I mean, nobody should be confident in one way or another. This this fight is it's a pick em and nobody should be favored here, in my opinion. But give me Martin Budai to win. I'll take Budai to win, TKO, second round. All right, moving on then. We have Marcos Rogeri de Lima going against Waldo Cortez Acosta. We got Marcos Rogeri de Lima. 37 years old, six foot one with a 75 inch reach, 13 and one and five and zero in his last five fights. Waldo Cortez Acosta, 31 years old, six foot four with a 78 inch reach, nine and zero and five and zero in his last five fights. So the line kind of surprises me in the sense of people usually gravitate towards that undefeated record. They kind of gravitate towards that hype and. Acosta is a guy that got a first round knockout on the contender series. Acosta is a guy that's undefeated, um, 2 0 in the UFC as well. So I figured more people would be on Acosta. And I'm sure a lot of people are picking him, but the odds just don't reflect that. Uh, Marcos Jared de Lima opened up minus 180, is currently minus 155. And then Waldo Cortez Acosta opened up plus 155, currently plus 135. And Marcos Jared de Lima has so many advantages here. So many advantages. On the feet, you know, we saw Waldo Cortez Acosta struggle with the leg kicks of, of Jared Vandera. Well, guess what Marcos or Jared DeLima is very good at, and much better than Jared Vandera at, the leg kicks. This guy kicks extremely hard, extremely hard. Uh, we've seen Waldo Cortez Acosta struggle with the takedown defense in the get-up game outside the UFC. Of course, Chase Sherman, Jared Vandera, and that Suzer guy, they're not wrestlers. They're not going to take him down. Um, so yeah, obviously they're not going to exploit the ground game of Acosta. Marcus or Jerry DeLima, black belt. He can wrestle. We've seen him do it before against Maurice Green. 
that could be a path to victory here. So he has the leg kicks. He has the wrestling. He has the power. One guy has power in Marcos Ojeda de Lima, and the other guy in Waldo is kind of a volume guy. The one thing I don't like about Marcos Ojeda de Lima, and this is a very important thing, is, is the cardio. In some fights, de Lima's cardio looks good, and then in some fights, his cardio looks very, very bad. So that's always a concern when you're talking about laying chalk on a guy like DeLima, but he just has so many paths to victory here where he should go out there and win this fight, whether it be by a first-round knockout with that power, whether it be by a first-round submission, you're getting the fight down to the mat, or whether it be by decision. I could see you know all different paths from Marcos to Jerry DeLima, but the cardio is the one thing that scares me. Like, what happens if this fight gets to the second round? That scares the crap out of me. So it's a fight that, again, I'm probably going to be passing on. It's a fight that I, I don't want a ton to do with. But the pick has to be Marcus or Jerry DeLima just because he has so many paths here. Um, so give me DeLima. I'll say decision. I'll say he does mix in the takedowns. I think it's going to look a little bit like the Maurice Green fight where he took down Green each, each and every single round. Um, I think Waldo's a lot better than Green. But still, you know, I think it takes down Acosta here, gets on top, wins minutes stay safe, and ultimately grinds out a decision. But again, a fight that I probably won't be be touching this week, sadly. So uh, staying away, probably. But uh, give me Marcus Ruggiero de Lima to win this fight. I'll say he wins this fight by greasy heavyweight decision. Moving on, we got Julian Arosa going against Fernando Padilla. We got Julian Arosa, 33 years old, six foot one, with a 74 and a half inch reach, 28 and 10, and three and two in his last five fights. Fernando Padilla. 26 years old, six foot one, with a 76 inch reach, 14 and four, and four and one in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. Line is closing. Uh, we got Julian Arosa, believe it or not, opening up minus 325, currently minus 150, and then Padilla opening up plus 275, currently plus 130. So yeah, wide line there at the opener. It's coming down a little bit, and rightfully so. I mean, Julian Arosa is not really a guy you want to bet as a favorite ever, um, but. In terms of this matchup, it's a tough fight to call because I think Fernando Padilla has a huge gaping hole in his game, and I think that gaping hole is going to cost him a lot of fights. Like any any time he fights somebody that can wrestle, have cardio, and have submission defense, he's going to lose that fight every single time. Fernando Padilla has the worst takedown defense I've ever seen in my life. Like it's got to be zero percent. Every time somebody takes this guy down or tries to, they're successful. I don't think I've seen him stuff a takedown. He's been off his back a ton, and he's a good grappler. He's a 10th planet guy, but you can't lose minutes off your back and expect to win fights. So that's this guy's problem. He's young, though. He's 26. His striking is okay. He's long. He's rangy. He's uh, bigger than pretty much everybody fights outside of Julian Arosa. Um, but my goodness, that takedown defense. So Julian Arosa has a, a clear path here, and that's to wrestle. Like, if Julian Arosa goes for any takedowns whatsoever, he's going to get them. And Julian Arosa has solid grappling in his own right. So I, I got to go Julian Arosa here to grind out a decision just by mixing in takedowns and just by Fernando Padilla having the worst takedown defense known to man. Um, but do you really want to trust Julian Arosa as a favorite? No, you don't, because this guy, he's super hittable. Um, Julian Arosa has... A, I think it's like a 50, no, oh my gosh, 48% striking defense for Julian Arosa. That's a problem. Julian Arosa, he's tough, sure, but my goodness, the guy's been knocked out a concerning amount of times. And that's going to happen when you when you have a 48% striking defense and block punches with your face. Julian Arosa's been knocked out six times. So that's very, very scary, but the path is there. Um, and if he is wrestling... He won't have an opportunity to get to get knocked out. He won't have an opportunity to get hit in the face. So give me Julian Arosa to win this fight by decision, grinding this one out. But betting chalk on Julian Arosa is a, a terrifying thing. This is a guy you want to bet as a dog, never as a favorite. Um, just because of that strike and defense, that chin, all all very, very suspect. So give me Julian Arosa. Um, again, a, probably a tough fight to call, I'd say. But give me Julian Arosa by decision here. All right, next we have Rodolfo Vieira going against Cody Brundage. We got Vieira, 33 years old, 6 foot with a 73-inch reach, 8-2, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. Cody Brundage, 28 years old, 6 foot with a 72-inch reach, 8-3, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. We have the 
the airline opening at minus 200, currently minus 240. And then Brundage opening at plus 170, currently plus 205. Don't lay chalk on Rodolfo Vieira. It's it's never it's never a good thing betting on a, on a guy minus 250 with, with no cardio. But he should win this fight. Um, Cody Brundage, good offensive wrestler. I like his style. Um, I like the guy in general. Big fan of Cody Brundage. He's going to come forward. He's going to force you to fight, and I think that's going to be smart in this matchup. you got to make Rodolfo Vieira work, you know, like Fluffy did. And so Brundage is probably going to come forward. He's probably going to knock out Vieira. Um, Cody Brundage is a guy that you, you watch all his fights. He's typically wrestling within the first 30 seconds. I don't think he's doing that here. If he does, I'd be very shocked, uh, but maybe he does. I don't know, but I expect him to just pressure Vieira make him work and strike with him and, and honestly try to knock him out. I don't expect Brundage to wrestle here. If he does, he's, he's getting subbed. Um, the big concern I have with Cody Brundage is on top, he's solid, like his wrestling offensively solid, but his, his ground game when he's on his back. Every time we've seen Cody Brundage off his back, it, it's been a very bad look. Mikel Olasaychuk reversed him, got on top. The fight had to been over like 30 seconds later. Um, just showed no ability to get up. No ability to really do anything off his back. Um, against William Knight, um, William Knight, uh, Cody shot him for a takedown. William Knight hurt him, got on top, and, and finished him shortly after. Against Nick Maximov, Maximov was able to take his back. I, you know, I didn't like seeing that. Like, if Rodolfo Vieira takes your back, the fight's going to be over shortly after. Um, I think for Vieira to win this fight, it is going to have to be in the first round, though, because Brundage is style. He's going to force a fight here. It's not going to be like a walk in the park like Vera had with uh, Stoltzfus, you know, um, at, at his pace, you know, slow pace. It's not going to be like the Curtis fight. Um, I think a lot of stuff is going to happen in this fight, um, and I think Cody's going to bring it here, which is going to help him, but at the same time, I think it could be to his detriment. One takedown for Vera, and I think this fight's over. I, I really do. I think Vera's ground game, obviously that that's his thing. You know, he's a... Uh, a phenomenal BJJ black belt, incredible grappler. It's just the cardio with Vieira is the, the big concerning thing. Um, but one takedown is probably all it takes here to get the finish. So do you want to lay chalk on Rodolfo Vieira? No, you don't. But I'm going to take him to get this fight down to the mat, get on top, and find a submission very shortly after, maybe even a TKO. Uh, give me Rodolfo Vieira. I'll say sub one for Vieira here. But if this gets to the second round, it's going to get interesting. But I don't think it has a second, a second round here. Give me Vieira. Sub one. All right, co main event. We got Kyle Bahio going against Mikhail Olazechuk. We got Kyle, who is 30 years old, six foot one with a 75 inch reach, 13 and one, and five and zero in his last five fights. Mikhail Olazechuk, 28 years old, six foot with a 74 inch reach, 18 and five, and four and one in his last five fights. We take a look at the odds here. Kyle officially is the biggest favorite on the card, opening at minus 245, currently minus 300. Mikhail Olazechuk opening up plus 210, currently plus 250. And, yeah, I agree with those odds. Um, Kyle Bahio, not the most exciting fighter in the world, but, hey, I mean, that's a good thing in terms of him going out there and getting the win. He knows how to win fights. He fights to a game plan, and um, he's a smart fighter. He's a very smart guy, and we don't see that a ton in the UFC where you have a guy with a clear path to victory and they take it every time, and this guy does. This guy, Kyle, does, which is which is awesome. I like that. I like seeing fighters implement a game plan, sticking to it, and going out there and getting the job done, and that's what he does, and the game plan here is going to be to wrestle. Mikel Olazechuk, really good striker. He's a little undersized, for sure, but um, Mikel Olazechuk is, is a guy that has really good volume. He's a guy that has really good power, really good pressure, really good pace, uh, mixes it up to the body. Like I like his striking quite a bit. Like I said, he's going to be undersized in this matchup. Kyle's going to be a little bit taller, a little bit of a reach advantage. But um, Mikel on the feet is, is probably going to have the advantage here. I really like the guy striking. But the problem with uh, Mikel is going to be the grappling, the takedown defense, which both are, are really non-existent. On paper, a 43% takedown defense for Mikel Olozechuk. The guy's been subbed twice in the UFC, once by Crute in the first round once by OSP in the second round, and I think he probably gets his third UFC submission loss here against Kyle Bahia, who is a BJJ black belt. Kyle should have just a significant advantage on the mat here. It, it, I don't think it's going to be close on the, when it does hit the mat, and although Kyle has not shown an ability to finish in the UFC yet, I think that very first UFC finish comes here. If Kyle Bahia does not finish Mikhail Olozechuk, I'm convinced he, he never gets a finish 
ever in the UFC because this is this is a tailor made matchup. I feel like for Kyle to finally go out there get that finish win. I'm um, against Mikel Olszewski. So give me Kyle Bahao to win. I'll say second round submission for Kyle. I think he gets Mikel out of there um, with the sub, and I think he fights smart. I don't think we got to worry about him going out there striking with Mikel. He's going to get this fight down to the mat early and often, and I think the sub will materialize in that second or third round. So give me Kyle Bahao to win. Kyle Bahao to win by second round submission. Moving on to the main event, I did do a, um, a main event breakdown on Sunday. If you guys have not checked that out, be sure to go check it out. It went a little bit more in depth, but going to give the kind of uh, condensed version here. We got Ricky Simone going against Song Yadong. We got Simone, 30 years old, five foot six with a 70 inch reach, 20 and three and five and zero in his last five fights. Song Yadong, 25 years old, five foot eight with a 67 inch reach, 19 seven and one and three and two in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds. We see that Simone opened up minus 125, currently minus 115. Song Yudong opened up plus 105, currently minus 105. And I think it should be lined fairly close here. Um, last week, we were supposed to watch this fight for UFC Vegas 71. It was supposed to be a three-round fight. And I was picking Ricky Simone. Now we have five rounds. I'm sticking with my pick with Ricky Simone. But we have not seen Simone in the fourth and fifth round. Um, if I had to take a guess, though, I think his cardio is going to be fine in those later rounds. Simone's a guy that can wrestle all day and just not get tired. So I think he'll be fine once his fight hits the fourth and fifth round. But I don't think he'll be fine if he goes out there and tries to strike with Song Yudong. Um, Song Yudong, this guy has a ton of power. He's only 25 years old, supposedly. Supposedly. Um, only 25. Um, he has a ton of power, a ton of volume. And Ricky Simone, the, the big talking point anytime Simone fights, and he's, it's going to be, it's, this is going to carry with Ricky Simone for the rest of his career. Ricky Simone got knocked out by Uriah Faber, therefore he's chinny. Um, that's going to carry with him for the rest of his career. Everybody says that. Everybody's saying it this week. Uh, he's not chinny. I mean, he got caught. That's the only time he's been knocked out in 23 fights. Um, it happens. It's weird. Uh, it shocked me that night. It still shocks me to this day. Um, but yeah, he got knocked out by Uriah Faber. I don't think he's chinny, though. I just think he got caught there. Kind of an outlier, in my opinion. Uh, but still, Song Yudong does hit very hard. So Song Yudong potentially could knock out Ricky Simone. But Ricky Simone's a guy that can wrestle. He can wrestle all day. Um, Ricky Simone lands over six takedowns per 15 minutes, which is wild. Like, you do not see numbers like that from a guy. 52% takedown accuracy. So he's completing a little bit over half of the takedowns he's attempting. Um, so insane wrestling numbers. And we have seen Song Yudong in the past get taken down, get controlled. Uh, we saw Sanhagen get him down once. We saw Marlon Vera get him down a couple times. Cody Stamen get him down a lot in that matchup, control him a lot in that third round. We saw Kyler Phillips even take him down several times. So Ricky Simone's a very good wrestler. I think he's going to implement that game plan and take down Song Yudong and, and do it for the full five rounds here. But yeah, on the feet, Song Yudong is going to have opportunities to find that knockout shot. Um, it's a close fight, but give me the wrestling of Simone. Give me the wrestling, the pace, the cardio, um, the grappling of Simone, the ability to get it down to the mat, the ability to, if you get back up, the ability to take you right back down. I like that quite a bit out of Ricky Simone. This guy's relentless with the wrestling, and I think that wrestling is going to win him the fight here. So give me Ricky Simone to win this fight. I'm going to take Ricky Simone to win by decision. Don't have like a really strong lean on this fight, but... I like the the wrestling and the minute winning ability on the mat that Ricky Simone is going to have, and on top of that, his striking has came a long way. Like his striking is looking very good lately, showing power in his own right. But you're not going to really want to strike with Song Yudong, you wouldn't think. So give me Simone to implement the wrestling and win this fight by decision. There we have it, guys. Twelve fights. Interesting card. Interesting card. Interesting fights. Um, I do have, I think, three bets thus far. Uh, I'm not going to go crazy on this card. Could be a couple really sketchy fights that I just want nothing to do with. But from a fan perspective, I think this card is going to be very fun. Um, next week, we do have UFC 288, which is going to be awesome. Get a nice pay-per-view. Um, so that's something to look forward to. But yeah, looking forward to this card as always. Hoping to make some money as always as well. Uh, before we get out of here, if you guys have not smashed the like button already, go ahead and smash the like button for me. I do appreciate that week in and week out. It helps a ton. Also subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Also check out DFSbythenumbers.com if you have not already. I'm pretty ahead this week. So my full card uh, breakdown and best bet article will be out potentially even tomorrow, depending on when these lines drop. Like, if these lines get out early, that should be dropping soon. Um, but, yeah, really ahead this week, looking to already start UFC 288 tape, probably even today, um, just to get ahead a little bit, beat some line movement. So, 
Um, yeah, really looking forward to next week's card for sure. But we have the UFC two, the UFC Vegas seventy two. It should be fun. Best of luck, guys. Let's make some money. We'll talk to you soon, and see you.